Now, throughout the set of courses, uh, Brian and me have had a very sceptical point of view about understanding the very origin of the universe. We can duplicate in our labs conditions when the universe is maybe 10 to the minus 9 of a second old, and so we kind of know how matter behaves under those sort of energy conditions. But when we push further back still, say 10 to the minus 20, 40, 100, 1,000 of a second, we very rapidly go beyond the level that we're ever going to test with any conceivable particle accelerator. We also don't have good theories for this, because we know that we have relativity which deals with very massive things and quantum mechanics with small things. When you have things that are both very massive and very small, the two theories really don't mix. We need a grand unified theory, a theory of everything, and there is no consensus on what this theory might actually be. So, from my point of view, we've got no good theory, we've got no good experimentation, so should we just be giving up? Uh, should we just leave this to the philosophers and poets and rabbis and priests and imams? Now, to give the opposite point of view, we're very pleased to have Lawrence Krauss back here again. Um, a reminder, Lawrence Krauss is a regular visitor and visiting member here and also works at Arizona State University. Lawrence, should we just give up on the start of the universe? Can we ever know anything about oh, it? Oh, that's so anti-scientific. Um, I, 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 I want to quote Winston Churchill, who said, never, ever, ever, ever give up, and it worked for him. Uh, the point is, and definitely, Definitely, we should never think, leave things to priests or imams. We've seen what's happened in the world when we did. The point, the point is, we don't know what we don't know. But to argue that we'll never know something requires a level of arrogance that's far ex more extreme than, than even assuming we might know. We don't know what science can show until we try. Yeah. And so we just got to keep trying. And it is absolutely true that we are quite limited in what we can see. But new discoveries add new wrinkles and cause theorists like me to think about new things. Um, certainly the discovery of dark energy added new wrinkle. It caused us to realize there's something fundamentally wrong with our picture. Uh, and that happens all the time, and if, if we're lucky. It hasn't happened in a long time in, in, at, at a microscopic level in particle accelerators. It is true that accelerators can't are limited, but there are lots of possible observations that can push our picture back empirically back to almost the very beginning of time. So, so let's just look at that. So we have the Large Hadron Collider, which is going to be operating, we hope, at the TEV scale. Mm -hmm. So that's a fraction of a second. Yeah. And it's going to hopefully look and perhaps it'll find new particles. But do we really have a way to test how the early universe works based on those observations? Well, look, uh, when if we discover, look, it, it, Physics is connected, so particles are just not particles. They're part of a theoretical framework. And if the Large Hadron Collider, for example, does discover the framework of supersymmetry, then we, we actually have, we can, we have fundamental theoretical models that will not only be constrained by that, that will make predictions about what happens at much smaller scales. Because the theories must fit together in a certain way, and quantum mechanics tells us how they evolve as a function of energy, and, and ultimately, therefore, it, since in the early universe, we're going, we're going to higher and higher energies, we can know how the, the laws of physics behave. If we discover supersymmetry, for example, it will tell us with high confidence that our ideas of grand unification are probably correct. But that word is probably. But there's more, so, so you might say that, again, you might say, Lawrence, that's just speculation. You, you can hope, you can be very hopeful, and you can say mm -hmm. it happens with high likelihood, but how can we know? Well, in, in physics, we never really know anything. We just test things and, and we get better and better ideas of what's true. But there are other possible handles other than direct accelerators that can give us a handle on new physics. We don't know where it'll come from. One possibility on the ground is uh, we build large detectors underground, large water detectors, looking for protons to decay. It turns out if there's a grand unified theory, we would predict that diamonds aren't forever. Okay, but you don't have to sell your diamonds because they list, last a long time. We predict now that protons will decay, but with a lifetime exceeding 10 to the 35 years. It's actually possible to potentially measure that. How can you do that? 10 to the 35 years is a lot older than the age of the universe. Well, if there's a possibility that a proton will decay randomly once every 10 to the 35 years, if you get 10 to the 35 protons, you might find one decaying each year. And that's why we have these huge tanks of 50,000 tons of water underground at the Kamioka mine, for example, in Japan. So if we saw a proton decay, that would tell us immediately about the physics of grand unification, which would happen at a time when the universe was not a billionth of a second old, but a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old. And that would send our empirical understanding of the universe 
uh, forward by leaps and bounds. But we may not need to do it there. We may have already done it. We talked earlier about gravitational waves. If we measure gravitational waves of the ones that have been claimed really are from inflation. So the, gra the gravity waves seen in the microwave background. And seen in the microwave yeah. background, that the bicep 2 experiment seen the, in the polarization of the microwave background. If those gravity waves really are from inflation, and we can test that idea in many ways, then it tells us not only did inflation happen, which is profoundly important, but it tests the physics at that same scale, a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. It means that we could test our ideas back to almost the beginning, but that's not the beginning. So, so then we get to the beginning, okay? So we can take things back down to this very early scale of the universe. But some people, including yourself, ask the question, well, how did we even get to there? And that, that's, a, that's kind of a troubling question for me, is how do you create the universe? How do you, how do you have a beginning to the universe? It strikes me from pure philosophy that the universe must have always existed. Well, you know, first of all, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Brian. But, yes. but, but more importantly than that, that's what's great about, about physics. It causes us to realize that what we think is sensible is not always the case. And we now realize, as I've argued, based on what we know, that more and more, if you ask what would be the characteristics of a universe that was created spontaneously from nothing, without any supernatural shenanigans, they'd be exactly the characteristics of the universe we live in. Because, a as I think we've talked about in an earlier uh, lecture, the total energy of our universe appears to be zero. And quantum mechanics says that nothing is unstable. But not, not nothing is unstable, but nothing is unstable. Namely, in empty space, there are particles popping in and out of existence all the time. And if you wait long enough, even empty space will produce particles. If we had a quantum theory of gravity, which we don't have, and we may never have, but if we get empirical data pointing us closer and closer to that time, my suspicion is we, it's not impossible to imagine that we will come up with a quantum theory of gravity. But, but a quantum theory of gravity tells us the following. Even without knowing what it is, the variables in general relativity are space and time. Just like the variables in particle physics models are particles and forces. And quantum mechanics says, for particle physics models, that those particles and forces are fluctuating due to quantum mechanics. Any quantum theory of gravity would involve fluctuations in space and time, and in fact, would allow spaces and times to spontaneously appear where they hadn't before. Closed universes would appear. Spaces that literally didn't exist before would suddenly exist. Our universe could have been one. Now when you ask what happened before, there are two answers that are possible. One is it's not a good question. Yes. Because if space is created, then time is created. And time may be an emergent property of our universe. There may have been no before t equals zero. Now that flies in the face of everything we understand of causality and all the standard things we, we understand. But that may just be the case. We may have to have a new understanding. If there was no before, then there was no before. And that means there was no cause, if you like cause and effect. The other possibility is, it, it comes from inflation, is that the multiverse could be eternal. And universes like ours are popping into existence at any time. And so for us, the beginning was at t equals zero. Yeah. But for another universe, the beginning is today. And there may be some global time in a multiverse. And, and there may be universes being created every instant. We, we just don't know the answer. So let's look at the first of those. So the second one is a universe that essentially exists forever. And I use the okay. term inner universe being everything that yeah. is... Yeah. Uh, our universe and other universes. Yeah. The first one is saying there really is, and you wrote a book about this yeah. called The Universe from Nothing, where the universe as we know it is spontaneously created out of nothing. But nothing still includes a physical set of laws that allow it to happen. Well, that's the only thing. You have no space, you have no time, yep. you have no matter, you have no radiation. That's a pretty good version of nothing. Namely, by but nothing, you still physical you still laws. Hold on, we'll get to the physical yeah. laws in a second. Let me just point out, however, that even the theologians and, and philosophers who like to try and debate nothing, and as often said, they're experts at nothing, but uh, um, would argue, what is nothing? Nothing is non-existence, they would say. And it is, in every sense, our universe didn't exist before it existed. Yep. Nothing we see in our universe 
existed, except maybe the laws of physics. Right, and they would have had to exist essentially No, but the forever. answer is not necessarily so. Okay. Because there are multiverses, not just the kind that are proposed by inflation, but, but arising from string theory, in which all the laws of physics, even the nature of space, the number of dimensions, everything is variable. And it could be that it's not that there were fundamental laws of physics, it's that every different kind of law of physics is possible. So, and if you have every different set of possibilities fluctuating around, and even the laws themselves come, then, then even the laws in our universe spontaneously came into existence when our universe came into existence. So if you have every kind of law, it's like having no law. Now, is that, that's pure speculation, I will admit, but it's perfectly plausible. Now, the only thing that, that really seems to be constant in that picture is quantum mechanics. Because you want spontaneous things to happen without a cause, which happens all the time in our universe. The, light, the electrons, the photons being emitted by the lights in the studio were emitted but when, a, when an atom uh, de-excited, but there was no cause of it. It just happened, yeah. if you wish. I mean, we know the laws tell us it must happen, but there was no cause. Quantum mechanics it, it, you know, allows spontaneous creation. Maybe quantum mechanics isn't universal either. We just don't know. But one, as I say... That's an open question, and it may, it may mean that the law, the, there are one, it, there's two possibilities, either an infinite number of laws, or there's one set of laws that, there's, that, that, that allows reality to exist, and those laws have been eternal and will be eternal, and that may be the possibility too, and, and we, we don't know the answer, but, and we, but the point is, we, it's not as if we may never know the answer, we may be able to probe that very question, and, but independent of that question, the point is, that I find it remarkable as a scientist that something that I wouldn't have imagined would have been possible 30 years ago, that, that 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars, could spontaneously come into existence without violating any known laws of physics. That not only seems to be possible, but highly plausible. And that's why I wrote the book, because I think it is amazing that science has brought us to that threshold.